Then, no sooner had he burnt his name deep into criminal history and our imagination, than he was gone, and only his phantom remained to terrify successive generations and leave us wondering who he really was. Behind him, he had left five broken bodies, women on the lowest rung of Victorian society, whose immortality has been guaranteed in death as it never could be in life. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Kelly, whose death brought Jack's brief reign of terror to an end. Since then, the search to discover his identity has continued through a century-old fog that threatened to engulf the truth forever. Then, in 1991, a remarkable document came to light which promised to turn the known facts about the Whitechapel murders of 1888 on their head. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Robert Smith, Managing Director of Publishers, Smith Griffin Limited. And my writer, Shirley Harrison, who is the author of the Diary of Jack the Ripper. I mean, if the diary is true, then this solves a 105-year-old murder. This is the story of that document, a 63-page handwritten account which claimed to have been written by the one person who knew more about Jack the Ripper than anybody else. A journal written by the same man, who so far had only been known to the world by his chilling pseudonym, Jack the Ripper. Whoever Jack the Ripper was, he was a depraved and loathsome creature whose memory, many have argued, should have been buried in the earth beside his unfortunate victims. And yet today he remains, as he has from the very beginning, one of the world's most notorious murderers. But behind a hundred years of journalistic hype and sensationalism, there has always been a sincere desire to understand this unknown psychopath's sordid exploits and hopefully to identify the man behind the legend. Like some faded Rubik cube, the press and public alike have refused to let the puzzle rest unsolved. And with each new twist, Jack's future has been secured, despite the fact that there never has been any real evidence against anyone, including the three surviving names that were on the police suspect list at the time. Kosminski, a low-class Polish Jew, and Michael Ostrov, another immigrant. Montague John Druitt, a schoolteacher and barrister who committed suicide after the murders. In recent years, Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Edward Victor, the future Duke of Clarence, has become the most popular of suspects, even though he has a cast-iron alibi on each of the knights in question. And so others close to this most royal of rippers have taken their turn in the dock. The prince's friend and tutor, J.K. Stephen, and even 72-year-old Sir William Gull, physician to Queen Victoria. But if that encourages you to believe that we were destined to play the game of Hunt the Ripper by the same rules for another century, Perhaps you ought to think again. Believe it or not, this innocuous looking book has just moved the goalposts. Is it the answer to the mystery that has intrigued successive generations? Or is it a cleverly constructed hoax aimed at an eager and gullible public? Experts considered the options. You mean he went into his lodgings and then came out and yeah. dropped his apron and... 40 minutes back. The publication of the journal which claimed to be the confession of Jack the Ripper 
was the culmination of 18 months intensive debate and research. Martin Howells and I are in fact arguing. Listen, listen. listen. I have an open mind despite the fact I believe it. But even before the full facts were known, some had already made up their minds. This is a fake, it's a modern fake. It was penned by someone who most likely was schooled in the 1930s. More detailed research has been done on this document than has ever been done on any discovery connected with Jack the Ripper. I believe now, absolutely, 100% that this diary is genuine. Uh, I'm sitting on the fence. I've been on the fence for so long, I'm developing piles. <laughs> <laughs> True or false, the responsibility for the journal's entrance center stage was down to one man, Mike Barrett. His story begins not in the back streets of London, but in his hometown, Liverpool. It was here at the Saddle Inn that he met a retired print worker, Tony Devereux. I struggled for three year acquaintance with him and we've become very, very good, good, good mates. I used to go down every day of the week with his bread and with his milk and his bottle of sherry. And I ended up going down there this, this particular one day. And he turned around to me and said, Hey, are, Mick. Hey, are. That's for you. I said, what the hell is it? Take it home and do something with it. I said, well, what the hell? He said, take it home and do something with it. Mike Barrett discovered that his friend's gift was an old leather-bound scrapbook with some pages missing from the front. Sixty-three of the remaining leaves contained a legible, if somewhat untidy, handwritten scrawl. What he read on the first page disturbed him. I long for peace of mind, but I sincerely believe that it will not come until I have sought my revenge on the whore and the whore master. As Mike Barrett skimmed through the pages, it became even more clear that this was no ordinary diary. The thought of him taking her is beginning to thrill me. Tonight I may return to Battle Creek and take the unfaithful bitch. But it wasn't until he turned to the last page that the full impact of what he was reading really began to sink in. Uh, is fell off the back of a lorry story, huh? <laughs> Don must have arrested countless people who told him that they got it from a man whose name they didn't know enough. So one doesn't actually believe that, so it's either true or it's such a, a lame brain story that no great thought's gone into it. Is that what we're saying? I started doing my research, and the more research I done, the more I seem to be getting nearer the truth. However, having said that, Tony ended up dying in Walton Hospital with a massive heart attack. So I'm left with a diary that I'm not sure is 100% genuine. But that's what we're dealing with, and it is unsatisfactory. And now my personal opinion is that I do not believe that Mike Barrett is telling us the whole truth. I'm not saying it's a forgery, I'm not saying it's genuine. I'm saying my, my very strong feeling is that there is more to this story. Tony was never capable of forging. I honestly don't believe he was capable of forging. Okay. So if Tony didn't forge it, where the hell did he get it from? The first we heard about this, Mike's original story, was that my father handed him this parcel and said, I want you to take this for being so good for me and looking after me. Well, that was what Mike told me. And I said, he had plenty of people genuine people, family looking after him, so there's no way you want to give this to a relative stranger. We'd only known for a couple of years on a casual basis. Um, I'd say his brother, if he ever did have this one in his possession and he didn't want to give it to one of us because of what it was, I'm sure he would have given it to his brothers as well as I pressurised that man and I asked him question after question after question and Tony would never ever give me an answer. I think he's possibly covering up something, but yeah. I really do not think over the last nine months, seeing him in the different moods we've seen him with his wife um, in his home, that he could have sustained it all this time. But those of us who tend to, to be a little less critical of Mike Barrett are those of us who've met him. Michael Barrett I have never met. I've only heard what people have said. He can be telling every word of the truth, but a man he drank with in a pub gave it to him and said, you might find this interesting. It's not good enough. And I bet you cut this question. Since this has all happened, everybody, everybody, that's the times, okay, 
Australian Press, CBS, and your own company. Okay, I've all tried to break me. And I've all tried to change my story. Unless you can prove you got it off my father. I know we can't stop him, but unless you can say, well, you know, here's the proof. Well, we don't think you should be using his dad's name. I'll never change the story because when you're telling the truth, you're telling the truth. If the author of the diary was to be believed, he was being driven by a pathological hatred towards someone he constantly referred to as the whore or the bitch. Later, she would sometimes be called Flory, and even more affectionately, Bunny. This could have been his wife, as the writer also talks about the children, Bobo and Gladys. The diary also revealed a neurotic personality that fed off the extremes of love and hate, life and death. It painted a portrait of a man both tortured and thrilled by visions of his wife sleeping with the whoremaster. So, for example, at the beginning of the of the account that survived, we certainly see him being very angry at his wife and being very angry at her lover and wanting to harm them, but then realizing he can't harm them, and at least not directly, for fear of being caught. And then one sees the object shift so that it becomes a prostitute, all whores then become the aim and the object for his vengeance. And the nice thing about the, the diary is you can actually see that motive change. The diary revealed an incomplete portrait of a man caught between two worlds. A respectable middle-class Victorian father, husband and businessman on the one hand, and a deranged psychopath seeking bloody revenge and sexual gratification on the other. And as for his actual identity, the answer would turn out to be one of the most remarkable elements of the entire mystery. On July the 31st, 1889, at St. George's Hall, Liverpool, Florence Elizabeth Maybrick, wife of James Maybrick, a well-respected Liverpool cotton merchant, pleaded not guilty to her husband's murder following his untimely death from suspected arsenic poisoning. The trial turned the pretty 25-year-old into an international celebrity. But the fact that she had confessed to an affair with one of her husband's friends, Alfred Brierley, did nothing to aid her defence. James Maybrick met Florence Chandler, as she was, on board ship coming back from America. He, was, he, was, uh, he worked in America. And she was then 18, very pretty, lively, uh, Southern American belle. And he was ageing, pushing 50, and very aware of his declining years. She was um, a great catch. He continued with his womanizing, there's no doubt about that, all the time they were married. Um, she refused to sleep with him anymore, and that was the crunch, really. Um, he began to turn against her, and the marriage broke down completely. And by this time, his lifelong habit of taking arsenic and strychnine had really wiped him out. If the diary is to be believed, James Maybrick's habit of taking arsenic was fueling an already tormented mind. I cannot live without my medicine. I'm sure I can take more than any person alive. But how accurate was this portrait of Victorian drug abuse? The nice thing about the journal in terms of the way it talks about his use of medicine, first of all, he never actually calls it arsenic in the journal. He always refers to it as his medicine. Arsenic itself was a, was a very mild stimulant and it was an aphrodisiac. It wasn't really used in the way, for example, say cocaine might be used to get a, a high there and then, to be used as a major stimulant. And the journal reflects that. The journal doesn't actually have the individual who's writing it using it as a major stimulant in the way, for example, cocaine may be used. It's been used in a much more subtle way, much more akin to the way that arsenic might have been used. A week after the trial began, James Maybrick's young widow was found guilty of his murder and sentenced to hang. On the surface, the trial of Florence Maybrick would appear to have little in common with the events in Whitechapel, London the previous autumn. But there was no doubt that the diary was supposed to have been written by Florence's husband James. Apart from anything else, the Maybrick's family home in Liverpool was known as Battle Crease. A 
believe the Maybricks moved in at the beginning of uh, 1888 and uh, I have the deeds of the house but of course there's no reference made to them in the deeds because they rented the property and then following her trial in 1889 uh, the, the Maybricks moved out again. This in fact was his bedroom I believe, um, his bed was over in the corner there and off this room was his dressing room and next door to that his study. Well, the electrics have always been a bit of a problem since I moved in and uh, I decided to have a total rewire and they've, they've fitted a new main to the flat in 1989, uh, I think. And then over a three-year period, I had storage radi radiators fitted and I had a ring main installed in the, in the flat. The floorboards in James Maybrick's study had been lifted for the first time in over a century, just prior to the diary coming to light. According to the Times newspaper, the electricians denied finding anything at the house at this time, although two of them did admit to drinking at the same public house as Tony Devereux and Mike Barrett. In Liverpool, the Daily Post newspaper had been the first to become aware of the existence of the Ripper diary and the closely guarded secret of the author's identity. They too had expected to reveal a hoax. The first I heard about it was a phone call from a journalist colleague of mine um, back in April telling me that on a train journey from Liverpool to London, uh, he had met a, a man who had the diary of Jack the Ripper. We ran that story in the Daily Post the next day. I thought if somebody's bringing out a, a book of James Maybrick saying Maybrick is a killer, I thought it's a hoax. It's a hoax. So it's a this piece of scientific apparatus was devised by us in the uh, early stages to um, try and assess as we were going along what we thought um, was the likely truth, if you like, about the, about the journal, about the whole affair, uh, the Ripperometer. And as you can see now, it's pointing more towards the truth. I'm, I've really been outvoted by my two colleagues. I'm still rather sceptical. My gut instinct, perhaps it's fem feminine intuition or something, but my gut instinct tells me it's true. It is. We've got the man. It appeared to be a hoax. It's a pretty incredible tale, isn't it? I got the diary of a man I met in a pub. I mean, who would believe that on the surface? So it's been one-sided. Since, it, since uh, the confidentiality agreement has come out, uh, the other side of it is now beginning to be heard. I mean, I've had a chance uh, for the Daily Post to read the diary, and actually I've actually seen it. It's a strange feeling to pick up this old battered ledger and say, well, I wonder if this is true. It's a strange feeling altogether. Uh, if it is a hoax, it's the most fantastic piece of work. It doesn't read like a diary at all. In fact, it isn't a diary. It's more like the, the, I mean, there's no dates to it, there's no names. It doesn't say, it doesn't name Jane Maybrick, it doesn't name the Maybrick family by name at all in it. It drops clues. In fact, if you read it and you didn't know the Maybrick case, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know that Maybrick is involved in it. It's a strange, strange hoax if it is a hoax. We've got a mysterious document which turns up by somebody who takes it in a very amateurish way to the market. Uh, apparently coming from a man who's dead and whose family knew nothing whatever about it. Oh dear, oh dear. And I don't care a damn what anybody says. Everybody is going to come at me and I tell me, is it a forgery? Is it this? Mm. Is it that? I've got no answers whatsoever. I just don't know. For some, the uncertain provenance of the journal was already enough to convince them that it had to be a fake others were less certain. Far from there being obvious errors in the text, there were many specific references that at least proved the author's attention to detail. For example, today it is accepted that Mary Ann Nichols was the first Ripper victim. At the time of the crimes, however, two earlier murders had also been attributed to the same hand. Both Emma Smith and Martha Tabram were popularly believed to have been victims of Jack the Ripper. It wasn't until much later that it became clear that these murders were totally unrelated incidents. This fact alone showed that the journal was either a relatively modern fake or a much older document written by someone whose insight into the crimes went far beyond the superficial general knowledge. Was it even possible that a would-be forger could find a subject who would fulfill all the requirements of a plausible suspect. 
Could James Maybrick, a successful Liverpool cotton merchant, whose life and death was well documented, step into Jack the Ripper's shoes so easily? It was in the early hours that Mary Ann Nichols made her way towards Bucks Row in search of fourpence, the price of a bed at her lodging house. At approximately 3.30 a.m., somewhere in or near Osborne Street, she met someone. She must have thought her luck was in. There was a flash of steel, and two deep slashes severed her windpipe. Her attacker then turned his attention to her abdomen. Lifting her skirts, he stabbed her vagina and tore at her stomach with a deep, jagged thrust which reached far enough up to cause her bowels to protrude through the wound. Within minutes of the attack, the body was discovered, but her murderer had already slipped back into the shadows, and Whitechapel was about to become a part of British criminal history. Whitechapel, Liverpool, was and still is one of the city's main shopping streets. To the author of the diary, however, it represents something else. Foolish bitch. I know for certain she's arranged a rendezvous with him in Whitechapel. So be it. My mind is firmly made. London it shall be, and why not? Is it not an ideal location? Whitechapel, Liverpool, Whitechapel, London. Ha ha. No one could possibly place it together. But the choice of murder sites did not rest solely on the author's desire to play games, as Shirley Harrison discovered. We knew that his mistress came from, uh, one of his mistresses, he probably had more than one, but um, in the early years that his mistress came from London. And we tracked her down and we found her, and we traced her story back, and we found that uh, she came to London from Sunderland and she lived in Whitechapel. And we found James living there too in the early years. I think that was the time when I suddenly thought, gosh, this, you know, we really are actually onto something here. This is getting quite exciting. The public face of James Maybrick was that of a successful businessman and a perfect gentleman. A business colleague spoke of him as one of the straightest and most upright men in a business transaction I have ever known. Another described him as the perfect host. Another remembers him being particularly kind and protective towards his children. But the truth that lay behind a heavy drape of Victorian double standards told a very different story. James Maybrick was a drug addict and an adulterer, and his health was deteriorating as quickly as his marriage. The commonly held belief, however, was that Florence had first met her future lover, Alfred Brierley, in December 1888, too late to provide the suggested motive for murder. In fact, they met in 87, um, a whole year before it's generally supposed they met. So, but by the time the diary begins, which we've worked out to be probably March 88, um, they were already great friends. Yet again, the diary had shown itself to be historically accurate, and the possibility remained that we were stepping inside the dark and distorted mind of the real Jack the Ripper, for the first time. I will not allow too much time to pass before my next. Indeed, I need to repeat my pleasure as soon as possible. Annie Chapman was the Ripper's second known victim. And this time her attacker was determined to get the maximum pleasure from his partner. A strong hand seized her by the throat and sliced into it twice virtually severing her head. Then drawing her legs up and pushing her coat and skirt out of the way, he drove his sharp pointed knife into her stomach. He reached in and lifted the small intestines, placing them above the right shoulder. Again he used the knife to remove part of the belly wall, including the navel, the womb, 
the upper part of the vagina and the greater part of the bladder. Grotesque as this murder was, the writer of the diary had one or two more images to add to the nightmare. I took some of it away with me. It is in front of me. I intend to fry it and eat it later. Ha, ha. It has taken me three days to recover. It did not taste like fresh bacon, but I enjoyed it, nevertheless. She ripped like a ripe peach. I will not feel guilty. It is the whoring bitch to blame, not I. I've left the stupid fools a clue which I'm sure they will never solve. Once again, I've been clever, very clever. One ring, two rings, a farthing, one and two. Along with M, ha, ha, will catch clever. Jim, it's true, no pill left but two. Inspector Joseph Chandler was one of the first officers at the scene. Apart from a leather apron that belonged to the son of one of the tenants, Chandler discovered a piece of screwed up paper and a piece of torn envelope. The paper contained two pills and on the envelope written in a man's hand, the letter M. At 6.30 the body was removed. It was now that he noticed the contents of the deceased's pockets which were lying in an apparently neat pile. Popular accounts exaggerated the find as a pile of rings and coins. And although two brass rings had been wrenched from her fingers, the rest of her meagre possessions amounted to no more than two combs, a piece of coarse muslin, and, almost certainly, two farthings. One ring, two rings, a farthing, one and two. An interesting factor about his relationship, for example, with his wife. He tells us when he's thinking of the children that he's going to force out all fours of the children and just think about his wife when he's actually going to do the killings. So naturally one would expect that the victims, the more akin to his wife, the more they look like his wife, the more they resemble her, the more they would be a suitable victim. And yet here he is in one of the killings where he turns the rings off the fingers because they remind him of his wife. Part of him that feels sexually aroused by his wife is in love with his wife and yet part of him hates, and if the victim is too close to his wife, is, there's too much a reminder of that, then his feelings become confused. What he's really looking for is an object that he can just vent pure anger. Whoever Jack was, he was beginning to take more and more risks with each new exploit. The ferocity of his latest attack had increased dramatically, and its very audacity gave notice of a killer with an ever greater craving for blood. The journal, too, would have us believe that James Maybrick was on an emotional roller coaster ride to hell, and each page was bearing testimony to a tortured mind running out of control. Others were not so sure. Well, we know what he took from Annie Chapman. The Ripper took from Annie Chapman her uterus and her bladder. I consulted butchers and a chef, and they all confirmed that it would be physically impossible to eat a uterus by simply frying it. Cannibalism is one of the commonest aspects of sex crime. It happens again and again. I would say that um, one of the most interesting modern parallels um, with Jack the Ripper um, is Chikatilo, uh, apart from Gaskin, who so again is tremendously similar. And uh, there again, you have this cannibalism, um, slicing off pieces of flesh and chewing them and chewing the uterus. In favour of the manuscript, I pointed out that it does not make an issue of the coins and rings at Chapman's feet. I should have expected somebody forging a diary to have made a point of these, and he didn't. So far, the diary had failed to make any obvious mistakes, and the M left on the torn envelope at Hanbury Street would prove to be just one of a series of remarkable coincidences. Following Annie Chapman's murder, Jack the Ripper's notoriety was assured as panic gripped London. And the journal exposed yet another facet of the killer's personality. He loved playing games. I have read of my deeds. They've done me proud, I had to laugh. They had me down as left-handed a doctor to slaughter man, a Jew. Very well. If they are to insist that I'm a Jew, then a Jew I shall be. I could not stop laughing when I ripped punch. There for all to see were the first three letters of my surname. 
They're blind, as they say. It amuses me, so I shall write them a clue. A few days after the cartoon had appeared in Punch, the Central News Agency received a letter which began, Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. And it was signed, Jack the Ripper. At last, a concerned public had a chilling but compelling hook on which to hang their anxiety. But had it in fact been written by the murderer? The diary was in no doubt. Before I am finished, all England will know the name I have given myself. But had the author of the diary finally made a mistake? In 1910, Sir Robert Anderson, the head of the CID at the time, had gone on record saying, I will only add here that the Jack the Ripper letter which is preserved in the police museum in Scotland Yard is the creation of an enterprising journalist. It was a view echoed by other eminent police officers of the day, and now many researchers have accepted that the so-called Dear Boss letter was probably a hoax. The question was, if the diary was a hoax, why would it deliberately contradict current popular opinion? We are getting to something that's very important, which is, I want to know, who wrote the Dear Boss letter? Well, yes, let's be clear about this. The debate centered on the fact that Anderson never specifically referred to the Dear Boss letter by name, but to the Jack the Ripper letter preserved at Scotland Yard. Another letter, known as the Lusk letter, had been sent to the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, together with half a human kidney, two weeks after the publication of Dear Boss. And there was some evidence to suggest that this particularly sordid communication could have been the work of the journalist in question. The problem was, the Lusk letter had been in the possession of the city police, and therefore could not have been the one Anderson had been referring to. At least, that was the current position, until our researcher found a report sent by an inspector James McWilliam to the Home Office on October 29, 1888. In this confidential document, the inspector states that the Lusk letter had been forwarded to Scotland Yard. What we have here, at least, is an objection, which when we actually get to look at it a little bit more closely, what we see is that the journal has not made an error. No, no, no. I challenge the fact... Regardless of Anderson's statement, made 22 years after the events, police at the time had every reason to take this first Dear Boss letter very seriously indeed. It had informed the authorities that there would be another killing very soon, and that the killer would remove his victim's ears. Three days later, he struck again. In 1888, number 40 Burner Street was known as the International Workers' Educational Club. On September the 30th, the events which began outside this club would give future investigators more to ponder over than any other occasion. At approximately a quarter to one in the morning, Elizabeth Stride was seen being forcibly pulled into the street by a man. She resisted. The man then pushed her into the yard and yelled out Lipsky to a witness who crossed the road and hurried past. The witness also testified that at the same time as Stride was being attacked, a second man had come out of the public house opposite. Fifteen minutes later, Louis Diemschutz, a patron of the club, turned his pony and cart into the yard. The animal shied to the left as if trying to avoid something. Elizabeth Stride's body lay on the ground. But this time, there were no mutilations other than a deep gash across her throat which had severed her windpipe. Was Stride's death the result of an argument with her abusive companion earlier, or was the second man her murderer? Was her death a totally independent incident, or another Jack the Ripper murder? Of course, the writer of the diary knew exactly what had happened that night. I cannot believe I have not been caught. I would dearly have loved to have cut the head off the damned horse and stuff it as far as it would go down the horse's throat. I had no time to rip the bitch wide. I cursed my bad luck. I believe the thrill of being caught thrilled me more than cutting the horse herself. As I write, I find it impossible to believe he did not see me. Curiously, the journal draws our attention not only to the little-known fact that Elizabeth Stride's hair was red, but also to the possibility that she was killed with her own knife. The following night, 
A long, narrow-bladed knife with a keen edge was discovered in Whitechapel Road. It was caked with dry blood. Dr. Baxter Phillips gave evidence at the inquest and stated his opinion that such a knife would have inflicted the wounds on the murdered woman. The diary had once again alerted us to an important possibility that had been overlooked by modern historians. And that was just the beginning. Having been prematurely disturbed, Elizabeth Stride's killer was desperate to satisfy his lust despite the risk. My heart felt as if it had left my body. Within my fright, I imagined my heart bounding along the street with iron desperation following it. My satisfaction was far from complete. Within a quarter of an hour, I found another dirty bitch willing to sell her words. An hour after Elizabeth Stride had been murdered, PC-881 Edward Watkins of the city police passed through Mitre Square. The sight that greeted him was nothing less than diabolical. In a dark corner lay Catherine Eddowes. What had been her face was now a clownish mask of horror. Her nose and lips had been attacked with calculated ferocity. Her throat had been cut, and as in the case of Nichols and Chapman, her abdomen had been the killer's primary target. The left kidney and the uterus were missing, but there was something else. The thrill she gave me was unlike the others. I cut deep, deep, deep. Her nose annoyed me, so I cut it off. Had a go at her eyes, left my mind. Under each of the victim's eyes had been carved two inverted V-shaped marks. Together they formed the letter M. The killer was playing games, and so was the author of the diary. At the mortuary, the police took an inventory of Catherine Eddowes' meagre possessions, which included a red leather cigarette case. No one had ever seen any significance in this article, the only item of any real value among a pathetic collection of odds and ends. No one, that is, except one man. He believes I will trip over, but I have no fear. I cannot redeem it here. Of this certain fact, I could send him post-haste if he requests that be the case. The diary was referred